So, uh, like, I want to start asking questions which bother me. I have this, like, privilege, I guess. So, the first question that I want to ask, and I guess everybody of you can start in each order, but I want everybody of you to give, like, a few intakes on that. Do you think, like, we know that biases are kind of, like, most of them are rising. They are historical. Because, firstly, the data that we are scraping from Internet, if we're talking about the fairness in AI and uh, the data that we're learning our models on, it's pretty much, like, based on some historical biases, maybe gender or like age or something biases that are arising from some systems which were in the society. And also behavioral biases are also based on kind of historical data because some behavior arises with a new technology, like you invent search engine, boom, bias. So what do you think, like how maybe we don't need even fight historical biases because they will go away naturally uh, with the uh, history changing and the society fixing itself all of these problems? Or you're thinking that this historical biases we also should continue to tackle and to fix? Or we're just going to new biases and we're like leaving it behind and not thinking about it? And I, will, yes. I like how Florian looked at me and nodded so I knew I knew that he has something to say. Oh, let's let's uh, validate this, but okay. So my name is uh, Florian. I'm working for Gina AI. It's an open source company, uh, new search. We do uh, content-based search. Just that you know, I'm not an expert in ethics or <laughs> all the, uh, not an historian. But um, uh, expert in search. So at least like we're covering here the different aspects of the behavioral biases, aren't we? Yes. So, um, so regarding your question, I think, um, yeah, like ch changing some historical data also has a bit the threat of um, acting like uh, the past would have been different. So um, maybe also forgetting some things that happened in the past. For instance, when you use um, like um, some. Uh, open AI general to generated tools like DALI 2 to uh, generate images, then they extend the prompt to um, make it uh, gender conform and uh, consider different ethics. And um, depending on what you generate, if it's like generate a historic uh, graphic of something where you know it's uh, only one ethnicity or only one gender, and then it biases this towards us, and it's like uh, even going in the wrong direction, where you act like um, on historic pictures, there have been uh, equity in all sense, but actually it wasn't. So it, it can go into a totally different direction. And that's why very often I think um, uh, fighting a bias can also, you, you should take really care if you're not um, actually uh, adding another bias and even make it worse. Perhaps perhaps, perhaps uh, from my side a little bit to, to add uh, on, on that. I think uh, as uh, you had also mentioned in, in your presentation, it's quite important to first of all be able to measure the problem and then to be somehow transparent about uh, that. This is already, I would say, quite an important uh, step. And uh, then defining what we are actually optimizing for, for that particular uh, use case I would say is at least important to not make things worse, worse because if you already at least are aware that you are applying, let's say, uh, equality of demographics or uh, something along those lines, then at least you are not making the trends that already exist on historic data and in the society worse. Hopefully you are doing more than that, uh, depending also on the, on the use case. So if you go towards a more, let's say, strict uh, definition of equality of um, and, uh, opportunity or uh, uh, odds or outcomes. Uh, the more that you actually are aiming to change the status quo, the more, let's say, strict you need to be on the definitions that you are applying. 
But already the very basic uh, on historic data, depending on the use case, I would say is to not make the situation worse. So it's important to measure and at least apply some definition of uh, equality. Now, uh, depending on, on the uh, use case, depends on, as uh, we discussed a little bit in the presentations today, it's a different thing if you are somehow evaluating humans, it's a different thing if you are just uh, ranking uh, items uh, for, for e-commerce, the, the, let's say implications and severity of uh, um, impact uh, from a human perspective is, is very different. But I would say generally it's quite important to measure and be transparent at the very least. So that I would, I would say is where the, the baseline for, for me is. But uh, yeah, then as uh, uh, we are hopefully not making situation worse uh, and society improves, we're applying critical, uh, uh, let's say safeguards for the use cases where this, is, this really is required, then we can also over time improve it. Um. First, on, directly on that like DALE example you gave, which I think is a very good point, I would just say that what's very important is to consider generalization versus specificity. So we always get into trouble with bias when we take something specific and generalize it. And I think if you send a general prompt to DALE, which is like a historical figure XYZ, then I'm not so sad if they sort of reflect equal genders or, or ethnicities. I think if you prompted Dali, show me like a cartoon image of King Henry VIII and they misrepresented that, that I would have a bigger problem with. So I think it's about teaching people to be specific. So if you Google ballet dancer, and uh, maybe it misrepresents history to show a uh, diverse a uh, set of ballet dancers, but it is actually like they're still capable of Googling for a partic particular ethnicity ballet dancer if you so want such an image. Um, so that's w kind of one thing I think about that. And then to your question about is it enough to just assume that like history will pass out of our models and our behavior? Like, I think no, because <laughs> we have to. It's just like if you have children, you have to demonstrate, you have to show and not tell. Um, and if we want to train the data that is being used or change the data that will be used for future models, we have to live differently, we have to talk differently, um, and we'll have to continue doing that to reflect evolving like ethics. So it's, it's like one, just a personal anecdote for me, is that I, for a long time, when I was younger, was in a habit of automatically asking people, oh, do you have a boyfriend or do you have a girlfriend? Um, and I made a conscious effort to change that to asking, do you have a partner? Um, and it was something I had to consciously do. It didn't happen automatically in my case. Maybe ideally it would, but it doesn't. And I think that's a positive change. Um, and I think we have to keep doing that if we want to make sure that we don't keep ending up with different sort of biases in the future. I actually want to address the next question to Ramon too, because it came into my head and I think it will perfectly fit. But firstly, I'm very interested on the part that you said about the models, biases and algorithms like about children. So we're still like kind of this position to the technology, like a, something that we train like consciously. So we will talk about that more. So, okay, we understand that there is a historical data and we need to fix it. But every day we're, I mean, not every day, but we are inviting something new. Each of us is kind of working in some industry, pretty much mostly, I guess, IT. And some of here, for example, Raman is CTO of a new product. So it's, yeah. Yeah, I made it, but really, you're inviting a new product, you're inviting a new thing, and uh, is there any possibility, like from your perspective, guys, as inviting a new product, new features, and new ideas, start making it from the beginning without bias, because you can apply the old mechanisms, and they probably will detect something, but how to, like, do you have any personal idea how to try to ensure that you're not introducing a new one? Because search came, like position bias came, recommendations came, choice overload came, whatever, whatever. Like, I'm very interested. Do you think of any technique before like 
giving something to the world or you're like, okay, I will care about this later. I guess some of the biases, like behavioral ones and position ones, of like position bias is not specific to humans. So for example, imagine a dinosaur and 10 pieces of meat and dinos dinosaur will need to choose one. Will it fairly evaluate all 10? or just choose the first one looking depends on nice. The hunger. Depends on the hunger. Depends, but probably it will be biased by position. It's not e-commerce, but it's dinosaurs, but still not specific to humans in general. So I don't think that some of this behavioral biases will go away. So maybe we should do like, so here we're coming kind of to a question that Biases are completely human thing or no? Like, what do you think, guys? You work like with the uh, IT structures. You, Florian, for example, invented in Gina now like these searches. Do you think that bias is only human thing, or they're also like system wise arising? So, so what is the other thing? The non-human thing? Uh, can is biases? only our biases arising only from humans or it's also like the models that we are using or maybe hardware that we are using or it's hopeless because whatever human invents it introduces new biases so you're like kind of stuck in the infinite loop of inventing and fixing um yeah so i i don't think that there is uh, some hardware bias or um bias in the models so models are so general so and we with the transformers we make them even more general and actually uh, remove all kind of bias and therefore i think it's yeah, purely um, data related yeah so technically like now i'm thinking like we were talking about the that we're training the models and like training hardware like a children. So we're introducing to them biases like to our children. So recently it's a lot of talks about the, you know, the consciousness of AI. I mean, not recently, it's we're talking about it like each 10 years from the beginning. And with these big models, which were like GPT-3 chat, this uh, like DALI, DALI-2, you're looking at them and you're like, hey, conscious AI is getting closer, huh? No? And then one of the biggest problems of these models are biases again. So maybe one of you have an opinion that we should change in approach of like uh, doing this. Maybe this mechanism should be made with auto ML and like robots make robots. Can we get rid of this bias? like with humans or it's just like waiting until robots start doing robots and then it will come to the perfection. <laughs> Anybody who wants to do and take on this crazy idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I can try for that. Uh, though, yeah, uh, obviously I'm a little bit uh, further away from the technical discussion. So I will be, be, be slightly more philosophical for this, uh, for this question. I would say that uh, these machines have also, uh, in order to work, they need to be trained on something. Uh, as long as we are talking about systematic uh, uh, ways, machine learning algorithms, they need to be trained on, on some kind of data. And inherently, the, these data are generated either by natural processes or more typically by humans. So the possibility that uh, there is somehow bias in the beginning of the uh, loop of uh, learning and optimizing uh, is probably quite uh, quite high. But then the, the second part of that is not all biases are also equally bad uh, because eventually bias is just a heuristic. And some cases, a heuristic, like in the, your example with the dinosaur that, uh, that I quite liked, a heuristic, it's, it's, it's okay. It's, in a, even, it's an oversimplification of a complex system. So you are making a decision somehow a little bit easier. And this is, this is in some cases, it's, it's quite okay. When, uh, when it becomes a problem is when it affects uh, uh, the life uh, of humans, I would say, on a personal level. And uh, especially the more, let's say, the impact uh, is higher, the more important it is there to invest time and make it as, as good as possible and as, uh, let's say, safeguarded as possible. So also the amount of energy, focus, uh, attention, uh, uh, reward mechanisms that we would apply to different types of use cases in order to solve these types of problems is quite different. But uh, going back to, the, let's say, the original premise of uh, uh, having it completely automated with, uh, with um, uh, machines and algorithms, first of all, it would, I don't think that it will solve the problem. 
honestly, I also think that we are really quite far away from that still. So it's not probably happening in the next couple of years uh, or the 10 or, uh, or so. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the more that we are as humans trying to at least address the more problematic cases, the better it will be for us, I would say, in the mid to longer run. Yeah, so I, I agree, it's far away. Um, and what I also think is getting back to framing the problem, like what has to kick off this whole process is some objective that we give for now we're still in control, <laughs> quote unquote. So like, we, it's all about what objective we give it to work towards because that's how it works right now. It's not developing necessarily its own objectives in a broader sense, but one kind of uh, thought that I always refer back to is in our current system of capitalism, like if we're building things that are objective towards capitalism, um, and there's one thing that comes up around automating jobs is for the system to work, you still need people to buy things, as depressing as that sounds, and for people to buy things, you need them to have desire to buy things and you need them to sustain this like economy as we have it um and i think potentially ai uh, could develop appetites at some point but it's certainly like there's no appetite there so what are we doing all this for right now we're doing it to serve like products to people in a way um, and as long as that's the case like people need to have jobs they need to have appetites or uh, otherwise everything falls apart um, so maybe kind of bleak but that's I think it's a, it also a silver lining in terms of AIs taking over the world or whatever I actually like start thinking that like we are all like at least in this uh, committee, somebody with a, like a position which has a word like data in it, like data scientist or like CT or data somewhere. I'm sorry, Ramon, or like <laughs> like you know, so the technical people, and uh, we are usually the one who fixing biases in the systems because they're like I mean also there are like other people fixing biases in the other, but we are talking about the AI biases, but it sounds very philosophical and very psychological and like starting again our line of the questions and here I actually want everybody of you to give it and take uh, should you study psychology and philosophy to fix that or is it just a common sense or is it actually maybe a problem of all of the systems and the AI and development just because we're not studying the field of psychology and philosophy and we are just not getting that it's right here and it's easy fixable we just know the area and yeah, you, uh, Raman, you start, please, because you knew about this behavioral bias of position. Where did you find out about it? My take on the problem of ethics in AI is that it's some sort of a spectrum between being fair and uh, profits. So before just uh, discussing how fair should we be with AI, you should, as a business, answer this question for yourself. Like, what do you want? being fair or like being nice or being rich or in, in, the, in the sense of profits it can be short-term profits or maybe long-term profits it's also important and for some companies it can be important just to push short-term profits and just let it burn afterwards i we don't care and then from this perspective work on that so we technical people usually don't really go there so we usually got our uh, in, got some sort of an input from some other management people like, okay, please remove this bias or okay, please don't remove this bias, please. And um, so it's like a hard thing to do, but probably it's not really technical. So um, when, when building product, we usually do MVP like everyone. And then we just check if it's good search results. <laughs> so this is basically we, you were also asking, um, do we do we care about um, bias in the first place, first situation? I think first situation is just it should it should work, it should be possible to integrate into this other system, and it should give good search results. And then step after step, we discover what good search results actually mean, because um, usually our clients also 
don't know or they cannot can really express in the first place. Only when they see it, then they see, ah, no, by the way, this is also not a good search result. So you should also um, put this out as kind of a bias or something. So for instance, we're working recently with um, company together. They have a website where you can find animations for web developers. And then all of these uh, web animations, um, it's, just, it's just some short, short animation of uh, five seconds, and they are they should be found by search query. So user type in some um, text, and then you find this animation, and you don't uh, have any additional information there in, in this animation. So you, you have to search from text to image, and uh, as you know, nowadays with clip models, you can do um, embed the text into a vector and then also all the frames of the short video animation to vectors and then make your nearest neighbor search in the vector space. And uh, interestingly, um, we faced this um, typographic attacks in uh, known by clip. So this is a very popular uh, bias um, clip has that uh, it's pays a lot of attention on the label shown on the image. So it's basically doing OCR, but also cannot do differently. So uh, when you, there's a famous example where you have the, um, the apple and then there is a label on it, so on the photo, uh, with the name uh, iPod. And then the, the model thinks it's an iPod. So it cannot, it cannot uh, see the apple anymore. Be just because of the text handwritten something uh, something small somewhere and um, where we only found out that way so there was no um, or there must be ways for us finding out before it's the most efficient way was just deploying something give it to them and then they say no this is a bias someone searches for loading they don't expect the word loading <laughs> they expect the loading bar or or the spinning uh, circle and yeah then in the next iteration now we work on making this model blind, so you can solve this bias by deactivating some neurons in the model responsible for text recognition, and also some other tricks, but yeah, I'm, I'm diverging here. Yeah, largely I, I actually agree. Generally, it is quite uh, natural that you have an iterative uh, process, because also consider what uh, ML is actually doing in at least most of the cases to begin with. It is replacing all the systems that can be just statistics and rules. So you would have a rule that would decide uh, how you moderate users in, uh, in a certain, let's say, e-commerce platform uh, or a set of rules. Then you will replace it uh, with a machine learning model. And uh, generally, you would also have probably even more bias in the previous, let's say, iteration of this use case. The thing is that as we are increasing the sophistication, increasing the complexity, it is becoming more and more necessary to be able to, to measure and be transparent. So I would say it is quite natural that the process is iterative and it is not solved in one step. That, uh, that is uh, uh, not necessarily a bad thing. The, the, perhaps where I would put an asterisk is in use cases where the impact is really, really high on uh, human life, let's say deciding about a loan or uh, automatically uh, screening uh, CVs of people or even use cases that can potentially have uh, even more uh, uh, implications of, about people. There, I would be a bit more careful uh, to, to be as fair as possible from the beginning. And if not, I would even challenge if these use cases need to be automated before we are, uh, let's say, somehow ready to, to do it in a fair way. But for the majority of the use cases, it is actually quite OK to be iterative and improve over time. And this is, this is quite natural for me. Yeah, I think you put it really well. Um, I think a lot of the time there's existing biases and we're already improving over them. And the most thing is being transparent. I do, don't think we all should rush off and do necessarily ethics, uh, masters or whatever, although it'd be super interesting. But I do think everybody has a certain, like, I mean, this is more personal ethics thing, but it's a bit like Severance, if you all know the TV show. Like, I don't think your work should be completely distinct from the rest of your life. And I think if you have ethics that you believe in in your personal life, like ideally, not everyone has a choice, but you can choose to work for a company and build a product that reflects those ethics. And they don't need to be ones shared by everybody, but 
just I, I, I do think that makes your work more also valuable if the product you build reflects your own ethics. Um, but I don't think it's up to the, just to the technical people. I think most tech companies now work with cross-functional teams and product often involves a lot of user testing and user research. I know Facebook are doing kind of cool things, um, although I guess they don't do much cool anymore, but this is one cool thing they do is they source a lot of their users and they form sort of panels out of them and they ask them to vote on their own content moderation like um, policies. So they really like source from the public ideas. Um, so I don't think it should be just technical people. I think everybody should be involved in the process, but I think it can also be technical people as well. Okay, uh, actually it gives me a, a lot of thought of like, maybe I myself feel like I feel, like I feel I need to study ethics a little bit because still you need to understand what you're working for. Like if you're advocating for the clean data and everything, you need to understand what is fairness and what is cleanness. And when it's super subjective, it ends up, I think, not very good. We need to generalize the fairness to some extent level, but I mean, but I am actually very interesting now for the audience, not to make you guys like uh, feel that we're like overpowering here. We're the fair and square and you're like sitting here and hearing what are the biases are and not. So I want to ask you, are you caring about this? Like when you're using a search engine, do you feel like somebody that output is biased when you're using an app? Like uh, Rania gave, gave an example with uh, like right and left handed apps. That's a good example. I can talk about my own example of uh, a bias. When you're coming to a restaurant and there is a huge, huge menu, you know, like pizza, sushi, kebab, Indian, Russian, Georgian, you're like Jesus Christ and you're going home drinking a coffee because it's a choice overload, literally. It's a bias of the human being. You prefer butter, like more choices, but I'd actually give so many costs on the selection that you're just like, you can't select. And that's why e sometimes fail with the recommendation systems. So from your perspective, can anybody, anybody tell about the stories when they felt how bias from the applications were like coming into their life and it actually like bothered you? Maybe with search, maybe like with something else, maybe with trackers, maybe with like deliveries, maybe with something else. It's a long time. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> Woo. Okay, it's coming. <laughs> what is this actually? Ah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, the thing that bothered me. You, 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 you covered it. You, you speak into it. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, <laughs> so sorry. Uh, the thing that bothered me the most is so how how much Google or any other companies know know about me, right? Uh, it's not bias, but but the thing is the data collection has always bothered me so much. For example, I have tried many many things. For example, turning off you know microphone access and all these things. But even if yeah, somehow but... they manage and they they find it like. And the next day or two, yeah, big brother was in is my watching mind, you, huh? Yeah, <laughs> it comes back. But yeah, slightly off the topic, but I think I know that it's kind of been also can be connected to bias because the systems are built on the idea that they need they need to use your personal data to improve recommendations. But there are like two models of improving recommendation: contextual one and personal one. And contextual one works actually pre pretty good. If you're searching for it, you're getting it. So yeah, it's actually also a bias thing, or maybe you guys don't agree with me. No, everybody agrees with me today. That's a good day. I like it. So what about choice overload? Tell me anybody, uh, what do you prefer if you're coming to the some selection, some recommendation platform? Let's, let's do a survey for our friends from Ecom. You're coming to an Ecom platform and you're searching for a jeans and you have the recommendation of jeans. What do you want to see? Is there a person who can definitely tell which jeans they're buying? Just raise a hand. Like, first idea in. Jesus Christ, nobody knows how to buy jeans. We, we can make money on it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, like, with choice overload, 
uh, I think it's also sometimes a problem of just a behavioral bias that we we can easily deal with because it's like oh oh my god I'm sorry I'm so invested in this beetle throwing uh, so yeah but since we don't even recognize the biases in our life as you see like people here maybe are getting like shy and tired but in general i think i'm getting so tired in the life that i don't see a biases mostly maybe we should stop caring maybe we're like sitting here all good talking about it and we're like yeah bias it should be fixed but i mean people just pour it about how it works and yet maybe we should leave them on the first position the most clickable link and just make a lot of money from it. What do you think? Or ethics is like about biases is much more than just like it's it's very harmful. What do you think? Is it harmful or not to caring or not caring about the fairness and biases? I mean, sort of a random example I give is Virginia Woolf's book, A Room of One's Own, which I'd highly recommend reading if you haven't. And it's a personal essay about her experience as a female novelist at the beginning of the century. And she makes the point really well and articulated more articulately than I can. But that it's not just that she was seen as unusual as a female novelist. It was that the imagination of the world had not grown to like her experience or a female novelist. So it was really it was about, it didn't just impact her live life, it was the world's imagination. And I think the same about like bias, just because you don't see it, uh, doesn't mean it's not there. And our imagination maybe doesn't cover uh, yet. And I mean, every, everyone can look around the world right now and see a lot of harm being done one way or another. and. A lot of that harm is prob is in some part due to bias. Not all of it, of course, there's other things going on. I mean, you know, we could talk about bias towards certain animals on the planet, for example. Like there is lots of lots of harm being enacted in the world. So I think we should be imaginative about what part of that comes from bias and, and where it comes from and how we can minimize it. Oh, oh, you. <laughs> to be honest, I completely agree, actually. So I would say for the use cases where humans are, are affected, uh, definitely we need to put the bar higher. And uh, I, I liked really well the, the way that you phrased that, that our imagination might not even be there as a society in some of these topics. So fully, fully agree with that. But even on inside quotes, the more trivial use cases, like the, the ones that uh, you discussed about, there it might be less of an actual ethical problem to some extent. But fairness is even important to the sustainability of the marketplace, I would, I would argue. Because if you are not uh, fair and you are uh, biased, eventually you are somehow in some uh, sense less efficient. And that means that your sustainability as a, as a marketplace, at least to some extent, suffers. So it is even for these cases, I would say arguably important to start solving the problem. The, the urgency as a society is obviously much lower than the, the cases where humans are affected. But um, yeah, even there, I would, uh, I would argue that there is reason to do it. So it's like bias connected to reputation to some extent, because you, you're making a bias and you're losing the reputation. Yeah, it makes actually a lot of sense, I think. So I would say beautifully wraps up that we need to care about this. And I actually think that it's a still like, can, can I say that ethics in AI, it's at the same to time a very long discussed topic, but each time it's new. Like I feel it's like this because you introduce a new model, it's becoming new from the beginning. So I really like want each of you guys, except like the just enjoying this evening as much as possible, uh, just start thinking with implementing new things, how you can at least lower the level of unfairness from not only ethical but also from the technical side because it distributes more and more through the internet through the technology and it stays for a long time like as you see historical data of 200 years are arising in biases in our models now who could have guessed so 
I was super happy to talk with all of you. I am super happy. I'm very sorry for the audience that I asked these questions about jeans. I know how they're bothering at the 9 p.m. So I really want you to just enjoy the rest of the evening, talk to our amazing speakers and our amazing att attendees of the panel. I'm very happy to talk to you today. Talk to organizers and maybe come to speak to them and give like another successful event. Eat our food, we have a big amount of it left and now we don't know what to do with it. And I don't know, just enjoy everything and... And, uh, uh, oh my God, I, I, I got busted. Excuse me, I'm trying to read the message. So, really, I'm sorry, I, I set up such a mood to go and chill, but now I need to read a question from online, so one millisecond less. I, I completely feel <laughs> Okay. So related to the regulation, you see, mood gun. Regulations questions. How far does the, the upcoming AI act from the European Commission go to incentivizing companies to care about bias? In your opinion, do they go far enough? My question could be answered by anyone, but mainly directed towards Grania. So Grania, you're the victim here. Um, yeah, I, I, I... I don't know enough about it, it to really say that much beyond. I think to me, the biggest question is not whether it goes far enough or not, more it has it been structured in a way to incentivize, as you mentioned. Um, I think I worked, as I mentioned, in FinTech for quite some time and a lot of the regulation there does not incentivize anything. It just sort of terrorizes and i think that's a little just the nature of how the regulation is enforced and enacted um, and it's often enforced by people who are not familiar with ai or ml so i am more curious to see how it will be carried out and whether that will be done in a reasonable way yeah i don't know if that answers. okay I, I am very happy that uh, like you were the victim because I completely slipped off the moon. But it was a very nice answer. Guys, relax, enjoy. The one thing that I want to say, uh, at the beginning we said that the questions will be presented and the questions, I mean, presented in the means that we will give you a present. I'm sorry for my English. And uh, uh, so for that, I am the woman of my word. So we will do that. So please. Write us with feedback. My community manager, which I love the most, showing and pointing me with every sign language that we are asking for feedback, good or bad. It's very nice to hear what we can improve and make even more cozy for you guys. That's we are all learning here of our biases and getting rid of our biases. And uh, to someone who will enter the community, we'll just give there the results of the uh, t-shirt sending for the questions and we will ask our speakers to give our their biased opinions <laughs> on who was the best here please chill please enjoy please have the nice rest of the evening please applaud us for everything that we try to do today <laughs>